before we even start our message. Okay, well, once again, thank you for having me with you uh, in this uh, series of Egypt to Canaan. And Brother Mark, I can't hear you yet. Oh, you can't. Hold on a moment. I don't know what I've done wrong here. Um, give me a moment. Yeah, I'm unmuted, so. Okay. I should be able to hear you. You're not muted. No, I'm not muted, no. You are not muted. I'm not muted. And I can hear him, Steve, on Zoom. Oh, if that helps. Because I had it before. Yeah, it must not be a connection in the uh, I should in be the meeting. here too, though. How did that happen? Ian, you got any bright ideas? Is this? Is that oh, okay, Mark? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? No, the Zoomers can hear me. Patty, uh, Sandy, you can hear me. Is that right? Yes, I hear you, Mark. We're working on it here, Mark. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's not a problem. Give me a moment. Take your time. Oh, yeah, it could be this. Mark, say hi. Yes. Can, can you hear me now? Nope. Still can't. Yeah, that's not it either. I don't know what changed. I didn't really change okay. anything from last time. Fascinating. <laughs> I should be coming through here too because I'm connected and I'm on mute. Yeah. 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 You can hear me on Zoom. That's what Jerry I, says. I, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, uh, Steve, accident. can you hear me, Steve? Um, Jerry, can you hear Mark on Zoom? I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So I can hear you guys on my phone. It's just. Uh... Hey, Steve. Yep. Um, do you have headphones plugged into the computer? No. Okay, sometimes that, that helps as well. Yeah. I just don't know why. I got an idea though. Um, well, if I, let me see. <clears throat> Feedback. Oh boy. Actually, that's an encouraging sound. That's saying there's feedback. Nice slides to look at anyway, brother. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That should be bigger, right? How you doing, Dave? Good. All right. Thanks. Good. Hey, Mark, I think we're good. Okay, we're good. Good to go. Okay, just have him use that uh, there on the computer. Yeah. Yeah. Get that taken care of. Just let me know when you're ready. Mark, say hi again. Okay, yep. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so we're good to go? Yep. Okay, great. Well, I'll say once again, uh, before we get into the study, uh, I want to share with you our, our certainly our deep concern for a lot of the people, some of whom we know. Of course, uh, we've been praying for the Arnett family, Arnett McEntee family, and uh, certainly know Bill Ritchie from Scott Lee. And even as some of you prayed this uh, this evening, I know the voice is there, so feel very uh, close in that way to this meeting. All right, let's uh, turn our Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 15 to start off our uh, series again this evening. Thank you for having me and some of us down here from the Jersey area. We appreciate 
you letting us join in. Uh, this is the third message in this series from Egypt to Canaan, and we're going to take a look this evening at at least two or three incidences that uh, the, the Israelites went through as a journey from Egypt to Canaan. Beginning at verse 22, Exodus chapter 15, beginning at verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. And said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. And God certainly will bless uh, the reading and obedience to his word. Well, as I mentioned, uh, we are now in the uh, third message uh, dealing with the account of Israel's journey from Egypt to Canaan. And I mentioned from the outset, just by way of review, that the experiences that they went through, the Israelites went through, are a picture of our spiritual experiences as believers in Christ. And a key verse, very key, is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now, all these things happen. The emphasis is that all these things indeed did happen. They're not interesting stories that uh, have a moral lesson to them or anything like that. This is, is a verse that underscores the inspiration of Scripture. Let me just go back to it for a second. Uh, they are for our examples or for types, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. So it's for us to learn the lessons that uh, Israel went through so that we wouldn't repeat that. Unfortunately, we're people just like they were people, and we go through the difficulties just as they go through the difficulties. But we have the benefit of the Old Testament scriptures to uh, guide us and direct us through the help of the Holy Spirit. So we're looking at uh, this account of their journey from Egypt to Canaan. I mentioned there are three phases of Israel's experience that would correspond to three aspects of our walk in Christ. First off, uh, when they were in Egypt, uh, they were in bondage and affliction. We see that also in Numbers. And, of course, we talked about the Passover in our last uh, message. <clears throat> and then uh, as they go through the wilderness, that was the time of trials and testings. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verses 2 and 3, uh, God said to the nation of Israel, I'm going to do these things so that you would, uh, whether I... Uh, in order for me to demonstrate, in a sense, God knows everything, whether they would keep his commandments or not. And so they need to be reminded every word of, of God is, is inspired. And uh, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So that's what uh, God reminded them about as they were on their journey starting out in the wilderness. In the same way, the Christian goes through wilderness journeys as well. Hopefully not wandering, but journeys. As they get to the land of Canaan in type for the Israelites, it was getting to uh, the land of Canaan, the, the termination point of their wilderness journey, and then going into the land of Canaan, which is a picture of the victor victorious life, not of heaven, because they were battling there for possession of their inheritance. If you recall, I mentioned in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 that uh, there are blessings in heavenly places, but in Ephesians chapter 6, we're told there are battles in heavenly places. There are principalities and powers in heavenly places. So there's blessing and there's battle both in that regard. Now, this is the map uh, that we're looking at. So tonight, we're going to take a look at uh, this part of the journey. Uh, they came through the uh, this area right here, if you recall. Uh, they had the Passover. We talked about that already. And then cam coming through the Red Sea, we talked about that. Not so much the picture of salvation, spiritual salvation, but physical salvation. In other words, the Lord was bearing his arm to show that he was working on behalf of the nation of Israel. The Egyptians 
were in hot pursuit because Pharaoh wanted to contest the loss of his property. And so they uh, came to the point of the Red Sea and their backs were up against the wall, we might say, and God worked in a wonderful way on their behalf. That's what I remember as a new Christian when I was 17 years of age, that uh, the Lord began to do tremendous things. I, I still remember a number of different things, providing financially for school and uh, things along these lines. And it reminded me that now as a new believer in Christ, there's a whole new way of doing things, trusting in the Lord, depending upon him, praying and asking for his help, something I didn't do just a year before. So it's a reminder to us as God uh, brings us into certain situations is to show his faithfulness. And it's quite fitting that you were singing that hymn this evening. So God was definitely going to be showing his faithfulness. And we'll see that as we go through our message tonight. So now they're going to uh, come to the waters of Marah. But one thing I want to mention, they got on the, the opposite side and they celebrated the victory that they had in the Lord. And uh, this is a song in chapter 15. Uh, it's a song of the redeemed, and it highlighted the work of the Lord. It didn't emphasize anything on their part. It wasn't because of their great faithfulness. It wasn't because of their great strength that they were able to uh, glory in this victory. It was because of the work of the Lord. And we read about it, Psalm 92, it's good to give praise to the Lord. Psalm 147, verse 1, same uh, idea. I love Psalm 40. You know it. Uh, our, the Lord is our refuge and our strength. Uh, he picked me up out of the miry clay, set my foot upon a rock and established my goings. He put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. And wonderful things that remind us of God's great work done in our lives. And that's what they sang on the opposite side of the Red Sea. God had brought them through in a tremendous way. Psalm 106 says it was through the depths of the sea, you know, you hear the story, liberal theologians will try to convince that the Red Sea was not very deep at all. But Psalm 106 says the depths of the sea and uh, the Egyptians drowned in the sea. So it wasn't shallow at all. And God, in a powerful way, demonstrated his strength on behalf of his people. You know, we're going through a study in the book of Daniel right now. And last night was a verse that I was reminded of this. The verse 32, the people that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. And God uh, does great things on behalf of his people, whereof we are glad. So uh, these are all reminders to us as believers in Christ, the Lord is working on our behalf. We have to trust him, but we realize that uh, he is the reason for the victory and we should never uh, boast or a uh, glory in our own uh, strengths or abilities is what God has given. That's why I'm convinced that we'll cast our crowns at the Savior's feet, Revelation chapter 5, because we realize he's the one that has given us the strength. He's the one that opens doors, and uh, he is the one that deserves all the glory. So just a, a quick practical lesson there from chapter 15, the first part of it. I want to mention also that uh, God promised that he would lead them, uh, faithfully lead them all the way through. And so I purposely did not cover that in chapter 14, 13, and 14, or I'm sorry, chapter 13 and 40. But uh, he promised that he would lead them by day through a cloud and a pillar of fire by night. So the pillar of fire, of course, was to give them light in the darkness. Uh, the cloud by day was to protect them from the sun. And uh, here's an artist's rendition of it. You see the tabernacle. In the wilderness it wasn't here yet the tabernacle in this episode but that's what it would be the tabernacle in the wilderness the nation of israel gathered around that tabernacle we'll talk more about a tabernacle in another meeting but these verses are very important remind us that god will guide the believer all the way through he promises he always be there and so i love psalm 48 verse 14 that he'll be our guide even unto death. Now, I know you've had Rex Trogdon up there in the meeting uh, many times, I'm sure. <clears throat> I asked Rex to come along on a trip to Israel, and we did that a number of years ago. And I remember Rex using this verse, Psalm 48, verse 14, that will be our guide even unto death. I said, Rex, why did you have that verse when we're over in Israel in case there's any bombings going on? So we had to think that one through. But <clears throat> the idea is that 
God has promised to be faithful to us all the way through. And Psalm 78, verse 72 is a reminder of that too. He led them by the integrity of his heart, and by the skillfulness of his hands. Now, <clears throat> that is a verse that in context is about David, but a greater than David is also our guide and the one who leads us along. And the Holy Spirit is our guide. And so we read about that in John chapter 16, verse 13. And so just as the children of Israel went through the wilderness and continually had a means of guidance from the Lord, this case, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire of night, night, we too have the Lord to guide us, to direct us. And it's part and parcel of the Christian life. It's, the, it's, the, it's our heritage that we have that, that guidance from the Lord. And it's interesting, this pillar of fire <clears throat> and the cloud, at certain times you see it in front of the Israelites. And in this case with the Egyptians following them, it got between them and the Israelites. So it was behind them at times. And in Exodus chapter 40, if you just take a moment and look at Exodus chapter 40, <clears throat> let me read you those verses. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 40 and verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This is when that was established. Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and the fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So God made that promise. He would always be with them. He would never leave them, leave them and would continually guide them through the wilderness. That's the faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. All that I've needed, thy hand has provided. And so you were singing that. This is a great reminder of that, too, here in Exodus chapter 13 and chapter 40. <clears throat> a key principle of the tabernacle in the wilderness is that it was the center of their existence as a nation. So here's another artist's rendition of that. And, of course, all of Israel encamped around it. The tabernacle was in the midst, in the midst of the camp. And again, we'll have more lessons about this in a future message. But I want to give you that sense <clears throat> of the fire and the pillar. I'm sorry, the pillar and the cloud that would lead the children of Israel. And so good reminders to us. But now we come to the bitter waters of Marah. Now God is leading them by his hand. There's no question about it. It says in verse 22 of chapter 15, that Moses went, uh, brought Israel from the Red Sea, went out from that, to Israel, out from the Red Sea. Now they came to Marah, but they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. So now they are following the Lord's leading. And yet they come to this place where first there's no water. It says they went out in the wilderness, sure, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. So even in their journey, God had promised, he said he would test them, Deuteronomy chapter 8. And as I'm listening to the prayer request this evening, I'm saying, how fitting is this? Because even as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're tempted to think like some others might want to say that as you are a believer now, God will help you in all these things. You have a resource in the Lord with prayer and everything else. And we know, especially those who have had experience in the Christian life, that there are some real trials and tribulations that the Lord's people go through, like everyone else. And we need to trust the Lord through it. And here the nation of Israel is being led. And they went from a song fest by the sea. I always like to have these like an event that I know the word would have a song fest by the sea, or murmuring at Marah. And that's what it led to this celebration 
and joy that they experienced because God had delivered them from the Egyptians, now, only a little while later, they begin complaining, much like a lot of us. And they experience some <clears throat> trial. First, the trial was no water. Then it says, they traveled a little further in verse 23. They came to Marah and they could not drink the waters of Marah for they were bitter. So this is like asking the Lord, Lord, deliver us from this uh, dry land that we're in. And so God leads them to another place and it's even better. And that's the experience for many of us, even in life. We have one problem after another. We're thinking the Lord will deliver us and we're trying to get out of that trial. As soon as trials come, the first thing we want to do is get out of that trial. And yet the Lord may have a lesson for us in that trial. And uh, we, we quickly want to do that. And so it's a reminder of the trials of our faith. And that's what Peter tells us in his first epistle. In this you greatly rejoice. So now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the trial of your faith, or more accurately, the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, They'll be tried or tested by fire, may be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So God has a purpose for the trials, and he sends us through them. We know that. I know many of you understand that. Uh, this is uh, a major point in the Christian life. We know that Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, tells us that uh, all things that occur to us occur that we uh, would be transformed into the image of Christ. And that's what Romans 8, 28, 29 tells us. In Colossians 1, 27, same concept. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul would actually reprimand the Galatians in chapter 4, verse 19. It says, my little children of whom I travail unto Christ be formed in you. So the Lord's work is to, uh, to conform us to the image of his son. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, a favorite verse of mine, reminds us that God is going to complete that work at the day of Christ, until the day of Christ. So being confident, Paul said of this very thing, that he that began a work in you will complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. And of course, that verse in Romans chapter 8, it's also found in 1 Peter the sufferings and the glory that go together. For I consider the sufferings of this present age to be not to be worthy to be compared to the glories that shall follow. Always the sufferings and the glory seem to go together, and that's, of course, in the ministry of Christ as well. So the work of trials in the life of the believer. <clears throat> I always like to connect, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I like to connect this with a verse in Malachi chapter 3, in a future day, Israel will be refined. It says it'll be refined like a refiner of fire, like pure fire of silver. And the imagery there is the uh, refiner of fire, pure fire of silver is sitting over that pot that has the metal in it that's been heated up and the dross comes to the top. And then the dross is taken away and what's left is that perfect mirror image and so the refiner of fire the purifier of silver can look over and see the image of himself in that which has been heated up and the dross has been taken away and that is what the lord is doing in our lives too it allows us to go those through those situations so they're refined and purified once again uh in our study uh that we were going through last night i uh, saw this verse although i've read this portion many times i saw if you will, for the first time in a long time, in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 35, and some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, make them white until the time of the end, because it is still the appointed time. And so uh, a principle that we see in the school of God, and that is the refining work of trials. And that's what Israel was going through here at Marah. They were in the will of God, there's no question about that. Moses was leading, he brought Israel out, got them to a point where they were three days in the wilderness and there's no water. They call out for the Lord's help, maybe. Maybe they did that, but they went along 
and they came to a place where there were bitter water. So then what happens after that? Well, they cry out to Moses. If you look at, uh, go back to Exodus chapter 15, and in verse 24, it says the people complain against Moses. That's, that's what people do, right? They complain to the leadership. And they say, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord. That's why he was a, a person used of the Lord. He cries out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And so this tree is thrown in there. And because Moses did what the Lord commanded to him to do, that those waters were made sweet and the typical teaching in this portion is that whatever trials we go through there's another tree that we uh bring into the picture and that tree of course is a cross you know, it talks about the cross being the tree in galatians chapter 4 curses everyone that hangs on a tree and so the tree is a reminder of the cross and as we go through these difficult experiences we bring the cross into the picture realizing what the lord suffered through on our behalf our light afflictions it says in <clears throat> second corinthians chapter 4 worked for us a far more and exceeding eternal weight of glory and so these light afflictions amazing that paul would say that remember he was hit with stripes 39 times and went through all the trials and journeys often in perils among my my countrymen and all the different things he lists there as uh, some of the experiences he went through in his work as a servant of the Lord. And he calls them light afflictions. I haven't ever experienced anything like that. And uh, yet some of the things that we go through, we think it's the worst thing in the world. And it might be pretty tough when you're going through that. There's no question that uh, we feel uh that is probably the worst thing we've ever gone through, but the Lord tells us to apply the cross to our situation. So Galatians chapter two, verse 20, think of the Lord. Uh, he was uh, crucified and Paul said it well, he said, he loved me, gave himself for me, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Life that I now live in the flesh and live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Philippians chapter three, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, being made conformable to his death. Philippians chapter one, Paul said clearly to the Philippians, he said, I wanna magnify God in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I know a brother mentioned about Arnett McEntee and the family going through the grieving process and no doubt they are i've done many funerals here in my area and it's a tough thing for people to go through and yet despite all those things there needs to be the reminder absent from the body present with the lord it's wonderful as a ministry that arnett has had with family bible hour and serving the lord in conference ministry as i've heard him many times even had him for one of our conferences for Know the Word. Uh, he's with the Lord and it's far better. Can't forget that fact, it's far better. And uh, he's rejoicing the presence of Christ. And one day we'll see him and we know the Lord as our savior, we'll see him again. And so that's like throwing that tree into the bitter waters. Oh death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory, right? That's what we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so, therefore, brother, be unmovable, uh, uh, steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Good reminders to us from this episode here at Mara. And so we need to keep those things in mind, but after Mara can be the Elam. If we respond, to these trials in the way God would have us respond. You know, Job, when he went through his trials, he bowed his head and worshiped the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and he takes away. He responded in the right way. <clears throat> at the end of his, at the end of that book of Job, we see his 
He's got a new family. He's got double the substance. Someone said he had another family. His one family's in heaven, and he had another family, so that was double. And then everything else was doubled. Everything that he had before is doubled. It's not a guarantee in the Christian experience, but it's a reminder to us here from this episode of the bitter waters of Mara. After Mara is Elam, it's the other side of her trials. You remember what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. No question about it. Painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the pre peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You know, I can tell you from personal experience, I've come across some of the sweetest Christians that after I, I got to know them, realized they had been through such deep waters. These were true faithful believers who bowed the head like Job did and accepted whatever what was their lot. And you could see it in the radiance that was exhibited in their countenance. Uh, like it says, they looked unto him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. That's how it was with those some of those people. Just tremendous. Now, either we can be better for it as we yield to the Lord or we can be bitter. And I've come across Christians too, bitter Christians who have not yielded to the lordship of christ so the other side of trials matthew chapter 14 verse 33 is the episode of them going in the boat on the sea of galilee and after they had gone through the storm after they experienced all that they experienced when they got to the other side they said now we know truly you are the son of god it was not theoretical it was experiential in their own walk with the lord that's Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. That verse, again, Romans 8, 18, the sufferings of this present world are not to be compared to the glory that shall follow. So a reminder to of Elam. Now, if I can borrow just a few extra minutes and just talk about the provision of the manna. They complained at Mara, and God wonderfully provided for them. The very next thing that we see here in uh, Exodus chapter 16 and verses 1 through 36 is complaining again. So here's just another complaint. God wonderfully delivered them through the Red Sea. They get a test. They complain. God provides for them in that episode. And yet here they are complaining again. Chapter 16. It says, verse 1, the journey from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. All the congregation complained. It was contagious. We'll see in Numbers chapter 11 in a future message how that complaining affected them and why that complaining took place. But here's the provision of the marrow. They're back to complaining in so short a time. You know, in Exodus chapter 32, when Moses was up on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments, the Lord afterwards reprimanded the nation of Israel and said to Moses, see how quickly they have departed from me. You know, it's like that hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel prone to leave the God I love. So quickly, so quickly they fell into complaining mode. They complained against Moses once again, but Moses in verse eight of chapter 16 says, this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning, bread to the full, for the Lord hears your complaints, which you've made against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. They complained and the Lord heard their complaints and he was displeased. That's what Numbers 11 says. And so they complained. Manna provided for them to sustain them in their journeys, what the result was. Verse 15, God heard their complaint. And despite their complaining, despite their selfish uh, perspective on life, God was faithful. So great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Despite who we are, despite, despite the fact that we've had hours of ministry from the word, despite the fact that we've been, been on the path for many, many years, we still complain. Our complaining is rampant. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 106, if you follow through on this on your own, you can read it. It says they complained in their tents. 
So it wasn't just that they complained publicly, or I should say, they made it a great show, maybe in, in public, but privately they complained, we can be guilty of the same thing, thinking everyone's uh, out of earshot, and then we complain. Complaining is more common than we realize. We complain about the weather, we complain about other things that come up, and God is not happy with that complaining. Despite their complaining, they still gathered the manna because it was provided for them on a daily basis. It was gathered daily according to their need. Verse 16 talks about this. It says there, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Every, let every man gather according to each one's need. One omer for each person. And uh, they gathered that. Just to wrap up real quickly. When uh, it is described in verse 31, it says, The house of Israel called its name manna, which meant what is it? That was the question back in verse 15. And it is described white as coriander seed. That's an important fact that we'll come back later on to. Uh, its taste was wafers made without honey. That's what Psalm 19, verse 10 says. And Psalm 119, 103, sweeter also than the honeycomb, the word of God. And so the picture of the manna here is a picture of Christ, the bread from heaven, like this was bread from heaven. And it's a picture of the word of God which is pure it's described here as white wafers made with honey sweet to the taste thy words were found i did eat them and they were the joy and rejoicing of my heart i can just give you a personal testimony as a new believer in christ spending hours on end reading the word of god because it was just so new to me my spiritual eyes opened to see and understand spiritual truth and the wonderful thing, God has provided his precious word. So be sure to take the time. This is what it says. This was gathered every day according to the need. Whatever the need the person had, it says here in verse 16. According to each one's need, the word of God can meet that need, no matter what it is. And that can be met. And it says in verse 18, when they measured it by owners, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Paul would seize on this. Uh, truth in Second Corinthians, talking about giving. But in terms of our need for a word from the Lord, for a personal Bible study, to draw from it, you can't get enough of it. Other things you get saturated, you don't want anymore, but it's different in the school of God. The more we read, the more we want to read. The more we pray, the more we want to pray just opposite principle that we see and so here the manna reminds us of the word of god and of the lord jesus christ the description there is is parallels of those things perfectly again those verses in psalm 19 and psalm 119 remind us of that so uh, as we finish up here this evening just a reminder god leads us along even if it's into a situation that we're not happy with God wants us to rely on him, to depend on him. And I know those people that are going through <clears throat> difficult times <clears throat> right now, health challenges, I know that uh, the Lord is making his presence known to them. And, uh, and we need to be praying for one another and be praying for them as well. And then to get from the word of God, uh, his precious word that speaks to the issues of our life, the issues of our heart, and a reminder to us of the need for that. This is God in his faithfulness providing for the needs of his people. Thank you for letting me go just a few extra minutes on these things. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your precious word. Thank you that it does indeed speak to the issues of the heart. Guard thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness. And we pray, Father, as we again, follow and track the uh, journey of the children of Israel from Egypt to Canaan, from the place of bondage to the place of victory, uh, that we would learn, likewise, the lessons that you intend for us, the trials and the tests that we must go through in order for us to be stronger in our walk with you. Help us, Lord, to translate that thankfulness, that gratefulness and those lessons into uh, effective service on your behalf. Thank you for the saints here at Brockview, and we pray your blessing on them as well.
We give thanks in our Savior's wonderful and precious name. Amen.